Honourable Senators, His Excellency the Governor General approaches the Senate Chamber. Honourable Senators, please be seated. <laughs> Honourable Senators, I am present for the administration of the oath or affirmation of allegiance to Senators elected to serve in the Senate from 1 July 1996, as required by Section 42 of the Constitution. Certificates of election of senators elected to serve in the Senate from 1 July 1996. I inform the Senate that on 12 July 1996, the Governor General received a letter from Senator Jeannie Ferris resigning her place as a senator for the state of South Australia. Pursuant to the provisions of section 21 of the Constitution, the Governor General notified the Governor of South Australia of the vacancy and the representation of that state caused by the resignation. The Governor General has now received from the Governor of South Australia the certificate of the choice by the Houses of the South Australian Parliament of Senator Jeannie Ferris to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation. I lay those documents on the table. <laughs> Will honourable senators please come to the Will honourable senators please come to the table? as their names are called by the clerk, to make and subscribe the oath or affirmation of allegiance. Will the following senators representing the states of New South Wales and Queensland please come to the table? For New South Wales, Robert Leslie Woods, Suzanne Margaret West, David Gordon Cadell Brownhill, Bruce Kenneth Childs, Helen Lloyd Coonan, Vicky Worrell Bourne, and for Queensland, Ian Douglas MacDonald, John Joseph Hogg, Ronald Leslie Doyle Boswell, John Joseph Heron, Brenda Gibbs and Cheryl Kernan. Will the senators making the oath take the Bible in their right hand, and will all senators make the oath or affirmation following the form handed to them, including in the oath or affirmation their full names? The senators please now sign the test roll and the senators roll.
Will the following senators representing the states of South Australia and Tasmania please come to the table? For South Australia, Robert Murray Hill, Rosemary Ann Crowley, Natasha Jessica Stott de Sfoyer, Hedley Grant Pearson Chapman, Christopher Cleland Schott, Jeannie Margaret Ferris, and for Tasmania, Jocelyn Margaret Newman, Susan Mary Mackay, Paul Henry Calvert, Nicholas John Sherry, John Oden Wentworth Watson, and Robert James Brown. Would all senators uh, making the oath please take the Bible in their right hands? And would all senators make the oath or affirmation following the form handed to them, including in the oath or affirmation their full names? Would senators now please sign the test roll and the senators roll? Congratulations. Second time round already.
Will the following senators representing the states of Victoria and Western Australia please come to the table? For Victoria, Richard Kenneth Robert Alston, Robert Francis Ray, Charles Roderick Kemp, Bernard Cornelius Cooley, Cooney, K. Christine Leslie Patterson, Lynette Fay Allison, and for Western Australia, Arthur Winston Crane, James Philip McKeenan, John Horace Panitza, Thomas Mark Bishop, Alan Eggleston, and Andrew James Marshall Murray. Will senators making the oath please take the Bible in their right hand, and would all senators make the oath or affirmation following the form handed to them, including in the oath or affirmation their full names? Will senators now please sign the test roll and the senators roll? Yeah, mate, to you.
Two pages. Just here? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Clark, I remind the Senate that the time has come when it is necessary for the Senate to choose one of its members to be president. And I propose to the Senate for its president, Senator Reid, and I move that Senator Reid do take the chair of this Senate as president. Are there any further nominations? If there are no further nominations in accordance with the standing orders, Senator Reid is elected president and will take the chair. Thank you, Senators, for electing me to be your president. I regard this chamber as a very important part of the political process, and I undertake to discharge my duties with integrity and impartiality. Michael Behan retired as senator on the 30th of June and has just now retired as president of the Senate. And from the time that I was chosen as our candidate for this position, I have been enormously indebted to him for the courtesy and consideration that he has shown to me in giving me every opportunity to learn from him about the job of the president and the things that are done by the presiding officers in the building and in relation to the precincts. We worked together well when he was president and I deputy, and I value the friendship that has developed between us, and I wish him well as he moves on in his career. On a day like this, one reflects a little on the people that have been involved with one getting anywhere in life, and they are very valuable. There's one incident in particular I wish briefly to refer to, and that is the untimely death of John Knight, a good friend of mine and the first senator for the ACT. Some of you will know, some of you will not know, that John Knight, at the age of 37, died in office in March 1981. He left a wife and two young boys, uh, Jason and Joshua. But for that untimely event, there is no possibility that I would ever have taken my place in this chamber and had the opportunity to serve both the ACT and this chamber. And on an occasion like today, one refers to, I think, and thinks about such things. Uh, Madam President, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to be the first to congratulate you on your election, both on personal behalf and also on part of my, uh, my colleagues. If I might say so, I think the Senate has made an excellent choice. You have, uh, you have served as well as Deputy President and Chairman of Committees 
I think everyone has appreciated the way that you have, you have uh, controlled us in a firm but, uh, but dignified way, and I'm sure that you'll continue to do so in this high office that you now hold. And I was thinking a moment ago of the, the qualities that one would look for in a president, and um, not necessarily in this order, but possibly I thought the first would be a good sense of humour. You have that. Secondly, a good solid dose of common sense, and you have plenty of that. Thirdly, legal skills or the equivalent thereof. You're well qualified in that, uh, that regard. Uh, and fourthly, obviously, political skills. And you have, uh, you, have, you have been in politics now for a long time and very successfully in every, uh, at every level of your political uh, role. I refer from the, the electorate responsibilities here in the ACT up to the various functions and responsibilities that you've held in this Senate. So I have no doubt, uh, Madam Pre President, that in fact uh, you will even further enhance the standing of this chamber and this parliament by being our president. Uh, I'm a little bit proud that you were a South Australian. You're always welcome back any, any time. Uh, and I'm also, as a Liberal, proud that uh, uh, Liberals have, have, have now in the Senate the first uh, woman Senate uh, president. So I, can, uh, I congratulate you and wish you well. Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President. And on behalf of opposition senators, I certainly uh, wish to congratulate you uh, upon your election as president. I think today is a historic day for the parliament, uh, in particular, of course, uh, for the Senate, with your election as its first woman president. Uh, you've already, of course, made history as the first woman deputy president uh, in this chamber. And we in the Labor Party do congratulate you on what we believe is uh, a groundbreaking achievement uh, in that regard. We're delighted uh, to, uh, to see you in the chair. We acknowledge uh, your election, of course, is in accordance with the uh, principle that the party of government should hold the presidency of the Senate. And I want to say also that I do look forward to working with you uh, with a close working relationship that we established, I think, many years ago, uh, both uh, with uh, WHIP's responsibilities in this chamber. I know that you know your way uh, well around uh, this place. You have a very good uh, knowledge, not only of the formal standing orders and, uh, and uh, procedures of this place, but also the way uh, this, uh, this place works informally. And of course, there is a need for any president really to have a very good understanding of that, because you do preside in a chamber where no one party has a majority. But I'm very confident that uh, you will be treating all sides uh, with fairness, that you will be treating all sides uh, without prejudice, uh, no matter what the circumstances or what the issue that you face. I think uh, at times you are going to find uh, the remainder of the parliament uh, difficult and trying. It inevitably is in politics. I'm very, very confident, as are my colleagues, that you will be equal to that task, as you've proved to be in the other offices that you've held uh, in this place. Uh, I also, of course, acknowledge that not only do you have responsibilities in this chamber, but with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, you have significant administrative responsibilities. And in conjunction with the, the uh, Speaker of the House, we expect you also to fulfil those uh, responsibilities with impartiality and with fairness. Uh, I uh, can assure you on behalf of the opposition that, uh, that uh, Labor senators in this chamber look forward uh, to uh, a productive and cooperative uh, relationship uh, with you. I assure you that uh, as you commence your role as uh, president of the Senate that you have our confidence and on behalf of all members of the opposition I heartily congratulate you on your election. You. Senator Kerner. Madam President, warm congratulations from the Australian Democrats, and what a pleasure it is to be able to use the term Madam President. But being the first woman is not the only reason to congratulate you this afternoon, because the Democrats believe that in all other respects, 
you are a strong and deserving candidate for the position of president. I'm particularly moved to remark upon your strong record on human rights issues, which is acknowledged across the ranks of this chamber. Also, your diligent work on the processes within the chamber, ever mindful of the need to protect the reputation and integrity of the Senate, as you did in your role as opposition whip, a role some people thought you uh, left just in time, and as you, in your role as deputy president. I can personally attest to your unfailing courtesy, fairness and independence. Ten years ago today, on Budget Day 1986, was the day Janine Haynes rose to speak in this chamber as the first woman leader of a political party at the federal level. Ten years ago, the Democrats had five men and two women, but if you look behind us today, it's quite the reverse, five women and two men, and all the leadership positions held by women. So that's, that's, what, uh, that's our contribution. <laughs> They're okay. You have to be strong men in the Democrats, I can tell you. <laughs> but on behalf of all of us, myself, Meg, Vicky, Natasha, John, Lynn and Andrew, we wish you well. We look forward to working with you and we offer our warm congratulations upon your election. Senator Boswell. Uh, Madam President, uh, may I congratulate you on, part, on behalf of my National Party colleagues and assure you that, uh, uh, that you have our support and uh, our unanimous support and we uh, wish you all the best in what will be a, a difficult three years with the numbers so close. But uh, I'm confident and I'm sure all of us are confident that you will dispense uh, uh, even handedness in your role as president and I know that you'll administer your duties uh, faithfully well and well on behalf of everyone in this, uh, in this chamber. Senator Margaret. Thank you, Madam President. On behalf of the Greens WA, I rise to honour you in your election as the first woman president of this, uh, this House. I uh, hope that your example will encourage more women to be part of the political process. We still have a long way to go in Australia. I also hope that over time the, the language of the Senate and the language of politics will become more geared towards the society we would like it to come. We have uh, every confidence in your abilities. I've had great experience with working with you uh, in, in my last three years that I've been involved with the Senate, and I wish you very well in the future. Thank you. Senator Harradine. Madam uh, President, I should like to join with my colleagues in congratulating you warmly on your election to uh, the President of the Senate, uh, to that position which is a, an onerous position, and we come an onerous position, and even perhaps more onerous position in this uh, uh, particular Senate, as uh, the um, a debate uh, will go to and fro on various issues of uh, great importance. It, uh, but your background and your experience um, uh, serves you well, I believe, in discharging uh, that onerous task. You'll need to, of course, uphold the um, principle of uh, freedom of speech, uh, not only, well, in this chamber for a start. Uh, a fair approach to, the, to that particular principle, uh, but also freedom of speech, freedom of assembly and freedom of peaceful protest in the precincts of the parliament for which you will be responsible. And uh, I think that is uh, an onerous task, but a very important one to uphold those freedoms. And uh, I'm confident with your political background uh, with your strength of character and with your legal background, you are well equipped to perform that task. And uh, I am confident also, having worked with you for the last, I think, 15 years, um, and uh, seen you in action, uh, that you'll be up to meeting that very onerous task. Congratulations. Thank you. Senator Brown. Madam Chair, it's my first day in the Senate, your first day in the Chair. I hope you are feeling as pleasured as I am at being on such uh, new, t new turf and uh, I wish you great success and happiness and fulfilment in the years ahead in the chair.
Um, I wish to inform honourable senators that the Governor General will be pleased to receive Madam President and such honourable senators as desire to accompany her in the members' hall immediately. Can I just say thank you for your good wishes? And the sitting of this Senate is suspended until the ringing of the bells. The President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special, special blessing upon this Parliament, and thou, that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Order. I have to report that, accompanied by honourable senators, this afternoon I presented myself to the Governor-General as the choice of the Senate as President. The Governor-General congratulated me upon my election and presented me with a commission to administer to senators the oath or affirmation of allegiance.
I table the commission and ask the clerk to read it. Authority to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance of senators. I, William Patrick Dean, Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia, acting under section 42 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia, authorise Margaret Elizabeth Reid, President of the Senate, to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance to those senators who have not already made and subscribed that oath or affirmation since being elected or appointed, or since last being elected or appointed as senators. Dated the 20th of August 1996, William Dean, Governor General, by His Excellency's command, John Howard, Prime Minister. This is a statement in relation to the uh, episode yesterday. The disgraceful and totally unjustifiable episode that occurred yesterday afternoon in this Parliament House is one of the most shameful in this nation's political history. I am sure I speak for senators on both sides of this chamber when I say that the opportunity for law-abiding citizens to express by peaceful protest, by orderly and non-violent demonstration, or by other acceptable means, their dissent from decisions made by governments is acknowledged as one of the fundamental privileges in a free and democratic society. However, it is the responsibility of all of us to ensure that it is a privilege that is not abused. What happened in this place yesterday should never have happened, and those responsible for transforming what was meant to be a well-organised demonstration into an ugly and violent display that ultimately eventuated deserve the strongest condemnation. Yeah. Senators should be aware that every endeavour had been made to ensure this pre-budget protest activity would proceed in an acceptable and reasonable manner. There were a number of meetings between Parliament House security authorities, the police and representatives of the demonstrators prior to yesterday's rally, and it had been hoped that these discussions would assist in promoting peaceful protest action. Briefly, by way of background, on 4 July, the ACT Trades and Labor Council wrote to the Speaker and former President Behan about a rally to be staged at Parliament House on Monday, 19 August, and requested permission to conduct a march around the building. The presiding officers responded to that request on the 24th of July. They approved the protests and the march around the building, subject to the following conditions, that the march not commence earlier than 1.35 p.m. and be completed by 2.25 p.m. Marshals be appointed and clearly identified to cooperate with police in managing the march to ensure minimal disruption to traffic flows and access to the building for emergency and other vehicles and all efforts be made by participants in cooperation with marshals and police to ensure that roadways leading from Parliament Drive to the building and entrances to underground car parks remain unobstructed so as not to prevent the free movement of vehicles and people in and out of Parliament House, and that the march be contained to Parliament Drive. There were subsequent discussions with representatives of the Construction, Forestry, Mining and Energy Union and the Aboriginal community. All concerned were advised of the approved march and agreed to contain their activities to the authorised event. Most regrettably, this agreement was broken and the conditions were not adhered to. The protest rally remained peaceful until about 12.20 p.m. when a separate group of marchers entered the parliamentary precincts. This group refused to accept police direction, forced a breach in police lines and ran towards the main front entrance of Parliament House. Unfortunately, it was apparent that some of these demonstrators were affected by alcohol. This group was supported by participants from the more general demonstration who were incited to join those involved in rioters' conduct by a speaker from the official platform. Police formed a protective line along the perimeter of the Great Veranda which was subsequently forced back to the main doors. The police line was withdrawn from this area due to the level of violence being experienced by officers and redeployed to an area inside the front doors in support of parliamentary security personnel. This deployment stabilised the situation for a short period. However, demonstrators using increasing force broke through the first line of doors. Once inside this area, Demonstrators used weapons including a large hammer, a wheel brace, a steel trolley and a stanchion torn from the external doors to break open the internal doors. 
Simultaneously, a second group of demonstrators used other weapons to break into the Parliament House shop but were hurled at the internal doors. The shop was ransacked by demonstrators and major damage was caused by persons who subsequently occupied the area. After some two hours, the demonstrators were finally repelled from Parliament House and driven back onto the forecourt area and shortly afterwards dispersed. In addition to the events which took place at the front entrance to the building, incidents also occurred on the Members' Terrace, the roof of the Great Veranda and the Queen's Terrace. There were 197 Australian Federal Police on duty at the start of the demonstration, in addition to the Australian Protective Service officers and the parliamentary security personnel. A further 60 Australian Federal Police reinforcements were called out under established contingency plans. The outrageous events which took place yesterday resulted not only in financial, but more importantly and lamentably, human costs. So far, about 90 personnel have reported injuries, including lacerations, sprains, head and eye injuries. I understand one person required hospitalisation. An initial indicative es estimate of the damage to the forecourt and the foyer is up to $75,000. Emergency repairs have already been completed. The full extent of looting and criminal damage which resulted from the occupation of the Parliament House shop has yet to be determined. Nine persons were arrested and have been charged with a variety of offences. I would like to commend the Parliament House security staff, Australian Protective Service officers and the Australian Federal Police officers for ensuring that the building essentially remained secure. I would also like to acknowledge the efforts of several other members of staff who were called upon unexpectedly to provide assistance in the initial stages of the disturbance. In particular, I want to pay tribute to the Parliament House nurses. They performed in a most commendable and professional manner, treating approximately 40 injured personnel on the floor of the foyer. I also want to mention that the nurses were assisted in their efforts by our colleague Trish Worth and an anonymous woman, presumably with nursing experience, who had been showing some American visitors around the Great Hall when the violence erupted. The Speaker and I have asked parliamentary security officials to undertake an urgent and detailed review of the management of similar demonstrations in the future. We expect to receive this report shortly. I am aware that there's been some comment about reductions in parliament, parliamentary security staffing. These reductions essentially involve the closure of security points and I do not believe they affected in any way the situation yesterday. On a more positive note, I want to advise senators that the Parliament House shop will reopen on Wednesday the 21st of August as originally planned, and I hope that Bill Podmore and his staff will receive the support they deserve. They were stoic under enormous pressure yesterday, but they are already up and running with plans in hand for what will hopefully be a once-only and never-to-be-repeated giant sale of damaged stock. I would also like to take this opportunity to remind senators of their obligations in regard to visitors. Senators are responsible for the conduct of any visitors they sign into Parliament House, and this responsibility is not one that should be taken lightly. Finally, I want to apologise most sincerely to the Australian people and those from overseas who were visiting Parliament House and were unfortunately involved, inconvenienced, frightened or shocked in any way by this deplorable incident. To them I say, what you witnessed here yesterday is not typical of Australia or Australians. And I believe I speak for all my colleagues when I say we hope and pray it never will be. President, I Senator Hill. Leave to move the motion. Take note of your state. Is leave granted? Right. Senator Hill. Um, I thank the Senate um, and President. I move the Senate take note of your statement, and uh, I certainly wish to associate my colleagues in the government in the Senate with um, the sentiments that you have expressed. But I'm sure uh, I'm able to uh, to associate all honourable senators with those sentiments. Uh, yesterday was certainly uh, a sad day, a very sad day in the history of the Australian political process. Uh, and we must do our utmost to ensure, as you said, uh, that it is never repeated. 
And part of that, I think, uh, Madam President, is to, is to uh, ensure that uh, all Australians understand that we regard the sort of behaviour that occurred yesterday as not only unacceptable but un-Australian. It is not the way in which we seek to progress our, our democracy. It's not the way in which we seek to win the battle of ideas, which is what this democracy is all about. And it can never be tolerated in any shape or form. And if and when it ever occurs, it must be, it must be uh, uh, unambiguously and fearlessly condemned. And certainly on behalf of my colleagues, uh, I do that. It was embarrassing even to listen to you, Madam President, talking about overseas visitors in this place yesterday, witnessing that sort of occurrence and, in fact, being embroiled with it, within it. Um, and, um, and, and, and I think it, what it does demonstrate, of course, is um, that whilst um, the freedom of speech is so important to us and freedom of association is so important, uh, those of us who do participate within the democracy and organise rallies and demonstrations also have some responsibility to ensure that those, those who rally and those who demonstrate do so without resorting to violence. And I hope the organisers of yesterday's rally think long and hard about that, uh, that responsibility as well. Um, Madam President, I want to, uh, I want to add uh, my uh, thanks to the, to the police, to the, other, the protective services, uh, to those who showed uh, great courage uh, in, uh, in extremely traumatic uh, circumstances. Uh, they uh, were a great credit to all the Australian people yesterday. They shouldn't have had to be put to the experience that they, that they uh, incurred yesterday to put their own, own uh, lives at, uh, at risk, risk of injury or, or even worse. It should not simply occur within our uh, democratic process. I want to acknowledge also the, uh, all of those you mentioned, some the nurses, other officials within this place who also in such awful circumstances uh, be behave magnificently for the benefit of all Australians and they must never again be put in those uh, circumstances also. Uh, Madam President, uh, we think of those who, who were injured. Uh, we trust that they will make uh, speedy recovery. Uh, in some ways, we symbolically share their hurt. Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. Uh, let me say on behalf of the opposition that uh, the Labor Party too uh, condemns uh, the appalling violence that occurred at the doors of Parliament House uh, yesterday. We have always believed in the Labor Party that there is uh, no place for the, the storming of a parliament uh, or for violence uh, against uh, the police. Our sympathy does go out uh, to those uh, police officers and uh, others who, in fact, uh, suffered injury in the line of duty. But uh, our, um, uh, I must say that uh, we do uh, share uh, the disgust that has been expressed by many at uh, the violence that occurred at yesterday's demonstration. I do want to say, Madam President, that uh, I stood along with many of thousands of others at uh, uh, the uh, real rally that took place in front of Parliament House. And these uh, were many, many thousands of decent, hard-working Australians. And of course, uh, that rally was well away from uh, that place where uh, uh, a number uh, took uh, matters into their own hands uh, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, many, many thousands of people took the opportunity to, uh, to uh, peacefully and properly express their views on uh, a very important piece of legislation that will be dealt with in short order by this chamber. At the real rally, along with many thousands uh, of others, I, I heard a crowd, I think, voice a measured anger uh, at the changes that the government uh, wants to inflict on workers uh, with the Workplace Relations Bill. But uh, as far as the opposition is concerned, we make absolutely clear 
that we condemn acts of violence, destruction of property, uh, attacks on police, uh, attendants and other staff. And I associate uh, the opposition with the, those remarks that the Leader of the Government made in that regard. We have always been of the view that violence has no place in the political life of uh, the Australian community. We also, of course, uh, have always recognised the, uh, the right of all Australians to participate in peaceful but uh, robust uh, protest as part of a healthy democratic process. And for the opposition's part, I do want to make clear that uh, we do support the concerns of mainstream and decent Australians across all age groups and uh, occupations, such as nurses and teachers and car, car and textile workers <coughs> and the like, who are very concerned, genuinely concerned, about the thrust of uh, the government's industrial relations policies and uh, the legislation that's coming before this chamber that will reduce uh, their wages, gut the role of the IRC and no longer allow unions to properly represent the interests of workers. But let me say, let, 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 let me say, let me say, Madam Acting Deputy President, let, let, let me say, let, let me say, Madam Acting Deputy President, let me say, Madam Acting President, that that was the intention of the very vast majority of the 20-odd thousand workers who came to Canberra, who delivered a petition of a quarter of a million signatures to this Senate and quite properly and quietly demonstrated. But I say to you, I say to you, Madam Deputy President, we, we will never, we will never, Madam President, we will never defend the actions that took place at the door and inside Parliament House, and we will support you, Madam President, and the Speaker as, uh, as uh, you uh, undertake the work that you've outlined in your statement uh, to the Parliament, and you can be confident that you will receive the absolute cooperation uh, of the Australian Labor Party and uh, the opposition as we work together to ensure that that violence never occurs in this place again. Senator Kerno. Thank you, Madam President. Yesterday I condemned the violent and destructive actions of those protesters at the doors of Parliament House. I did. I don't know whether you heard me. I did, and I do so again today in the strongest possible terms. As you said yourself, peaceful protest is a fundamental democratic privilege, and abusing the property of uh, physically injuring and violating the rights of others certainly are not. I deplore the actions of those who, in my opinion, selfishly and deliberately chose to distract attention from the discussion of the issues which the overwhelming majority of those assembled uh, had come to hear. I join with you, Madam President, in paying tribute to the police, the various Parliament House staff that you identified, and in apologising apologizing to visitors to Parliament House, many of whom were schoolchildren. I'm sure we're all reflecting on the longer-term consequences of yesterday's events, and I take this opportunity to associate the Democrats with Senator Hill's motion. Senator Boswell. And I too would like to associate the, my National Party colleagues with your remarks and uh, Senator Hill's remarks. Yesterday uh, saw a very sad day for Australia with a very vindictive display of assault on our uh, parliamentary democracy. I believe our democratic right to assemble was challenged yesterday. 
The actions were brutal and the actions were ugly. And uh, it left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. While 30,000 people assembled, or 25 or whatever it was, and that's their right to come down here to express their views, as we've seen 40,000 farmers on the grass outside the old parliament house. We saw a number of loggers, trucks, and their behaviour uh, was fine, it wasn't offensive, and they made their point. But yesterday we saw the very worst of people come through. And, uh, we saw some brutal scenes, particularly the, uh, it was relayed to me today of a, a policewoman that was kicked, had her ribs broken. I mean, it, as far as the union movement was concerned, it was an absolute disaster in the public relations stakes. And one would have to question the ACTU. Now, if you're going to have a demonstration, and everyone in this parliament would acknowledge that it's the right to anyone to demonstrate. But there is a responsibility on those people that organise the demonstration. And the ACTU organised that demonstration and they let it get completely out of control and they've got to be condemned for that and they've got to wear it. And, and one would have to ask, one would have to query, would you want to put your wages policy in the hands of the ACTU after that display, or would you want to put anything in the hands of the ACTU? It's the industrial wing of the ALP, and you guys over there, and girls and senators, are, you have to be responsible, and you've got to wear your share of the, the general responsibility. Mr. Madam President, it's a sorry day for Australia. It's a sorry day for this parliament. And, uh, and I would, I would like to extend uh, my sympathy for the people that were hurt, the people that did defend the democratic processes at the gate out there, at the doors, when they uh, acted in the best interest of this parliament. Senator Margetts. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I remember years ago um, being associated with uh, protests for nuclear disarmament where there were 3,000 people protesting in Fremantle against uh, the violence of nuclear warships. And on that particular occasion, there were five people who were involved with, uh, with an altercation with uh, police on horses. And uh, that was what was portrayed as the main issue as a result of that protest. 3,000 peaceful protesters five people who felt they wanted to say things in a different way, and the only message that people uh, gained publicly at the end of that was the five people who wanted to say things in a different way. The Greens WA do not associate ourselves with the violent action that occurred yesterday. And, uh, uh, the, in the, if you like, historical tradition of um, my former colleague Joe Valentine believe in uh, non-violent direct action. There are some people obviously in the uh, Green movement who have differing viewpoints on that, but personally I associate myself with non-violent direct action. I do not believe there was uh, any justification for the use of violence uh, to the extent we saw yesterday and to the detriment of people's um, health and security. There is, um, however, some. Uh, there's been a number of reports in relation to the triggering incident, and I think it's necessary to put on the record that the group who did join, uh, that the group who joined later or attempted to join later, the group were in fact attempting to join in on the protest side. They weren't, in fact moving towards Parliament House, and there was possibly an error of judgment in debarring them from actually an Aboriginal group from participating and joining in with the group. Now, I do not, I do not, um, it is not a justification for those people from the main group for taking the violent action that they did, but I do believe if we're going to deal with this issue, to be just, the anger, much of the anger 
was involved with not allowing those, uh, the group of Aboriginal people to be part of the protest group that was meeting and meeting peacefully at that time. I have not order. Sometimes, sometimes when such violence occurs, order, order, order. Sometimes, thank. You. Sometimes when such violence occurs, it is used to mask the uh, the other violence in society, the violence associated with the the deliberate dividing of society and the forced marginalisation of large people in our society. And when we do this enough, the argument becomes a law and order issue. I think we should be dealing with these issues before they, this becomes the major debate in this or any other parliament. What is the basis of the violence that is causing the marginalisation of our community, and should we not, as a parliament, be dealing with that issue as the primary issue and not the symptoms of that violence? Question is, Senator Harradine. Um, Madam uh, Chair, uh, Madam President, um, as a uh, Parliamentarian of 20, uh, for 21 years, as a trade unionist continuously for the last 40 years, I join with uh, colleagues right around this chamber uh, in uh, my expression of condemnation of what occurred yesterday. It was an attack on the symbol of our democratic way of life. It besmirched the name, the good name, of the trade union movement. And we can't allow a handful of Trotskyists, anarchists, and thugs to so exploit the feelings and the genuine feelings of many people and thrust them into violent activity. That sort of anarchy, that sort of individualism strikes at the very heart of our democracy and indeed strikes at the heart of what we all want, I hope, and that in the industrial area of orderly industrial progress. Can I be permitted briefly to say that I believe that some forms of economic rationalism combined with utilitarian philosophies are in fact that an exhibit on the other side of that sort of anarchy, which will in fact uh, demean uh, the, uh, and uh, cause a disorderly industrial progress. I have to say that I was not um, here yesterday uh, at that time. I did send a message to uh, the meeting, uh, and the message indicated that I believe it was my view that uh, the Workplace uh, Relations Bill, as currently drafted, uh, was uh, uh, would promote uh, an un-Australian, a self-centred and selfish I'm all right Jack attitude. And if that prevailed, then workplace relations would be soured and the unity which is necessary to protect the, family, the workers and their families would suffer. But Last night, I did see in my room the visuals, the pictures of what happened. The storming of this parliament, as I say, said, the symbol of our dem democratic way of life. And I saw uh, those 
violent actions which cause uh, such injuries uh, to police, uh, to emergency workers and to other workers in this uh, parliament who serve us as members of parliament. I saw the terror in the eyes of children and the anxiety that uh, the international visitors and Australian visitors uh, experienced. Those Australians who rightly regard this parliament as our house. And this violence occurred in our house. And somehow or another, as a trade unionist, I feel, and as a member of parliament, I feel a sense of shame. I don't know why, but I feel a sense of shame. I could not sleep last night. I wrote, um, I came in here and about four o'clock this morning, I did write a, 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 a resolution. I'm not going to propose it because we have the opportunity of speaking now. But I did wander around the hall down there and I could hear echoing. The voices, yes, the voices of Labor members of parliament who'd come through the trade union movement, the voices of Chipley, the voices of Percy Cleary, the voices of other great Labor leaders, all of whom would have roundly condemned the action that we saw yesterday. And I'm very pleased to hear uh, what Senator Beasley, uh, what uh, Kim Beasley said yesterday, and uh, what uh, the leader of the government, uh, the opposition here, uh, said today. We should indeed deplore the action. Take the the damage that was done to the parliamentary shop. What's the parliamentary shop there for? It, from the parliamentary shop thousands upon thousands of visitors obtained the information about how our parliamentary democracy works. And here the thugs trashed that parliament house shop. That parliament house shop does so much for the understanding and for people who visit to understand better and better appreciate our Australian system of parliamentary democracy. It is in fact this system of parliamentary democracy uh, which enables the people of Australia to participate in the political process and to freely elect representatives uh, to this parliament to speak for them and to make laws for the peace order and good government of this our beloved nation. Many of our forebears have sacrificed. Some paid the supreme sacrifice to defend our democratic way of life. And the attack on Parliament House yesterday was an attack on that democratic way of life. We express here, and we have been expressing, on behalf of the Australian people and of all of those individuals and community organisations who work so hard to protect and improve that way of life, and we also, I have heard, resolve to defend it and constantly seek better ways of making this parliament a parliament for the people, by the people and of the people. I would like to re-emphasise what has been said about, uh, by you, Madam President, about the right of freedom of speech, of freedom of assembly, of the right uh, to peaceful demonstrations. I mean, that right is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I have heard people say today, keep all these demos away from the place. Put them right down below. 
I know, Madam, uh, uh, Madam President, that you in charge of the precincts of this parliament would not agree with that. I, I'm hearing from you that, in fact, you do uphold the right to freedom of association and the right uh, to uh, uh, freedom of speech and peaceful uh, uh, protest. And I'm very pleased to hear that. In fact, it was that right which these thugs violated yesterday. And uh, I note uh, that the ACTU condemned uh, those uh, violators. I think it would be uh, useful, though, for that condemnation to be a practical matter. It's not for me to tell the ACTU how to work, but I know uh, that uh, 30 years ago, um, uh, um, in the uh, early 60s, in the, in the mid 60s, when I was Secretary of the Tasmanian Trades and Labor Council, we did have that, this problem of uh, what needs to be done for the trade union movement to be united in achieving orderly industrial progress. Albert Monk, I can hear we had executive meeting after executive meeting from the, uh, on the ACTU executive, and we were confronted by the types of actions that we saw yesterday in other areas. And uh, uh, we uh, believed, for example, when, how, how often do you hear it these days, but we, we believe there were five principles which should govern uh, whether or not a strike should take place. Whether that's uh, the, the, the dispute where the cause was serious and just. Whether it had the overwhelming support uh, of the workers. Uh, whether other reasonable means had been utilised to overcome the dispute, whether the, uh, whether the outcomes, the good outcomes, far outweighed the inconvenience that might take place, and fifthly, that the, uh, that the action should be, the strike should be a peaceful, operating peacefully. And I believe that what happened yesterday, insofar as some of it was done by uh, by uh, uh, union members, that when all of the details are in, I believe that it would serve the trade union movement well for the rules of that union to be applied quite stringently uh, to the persons who breach those rules and besmirch the name of the trade union movement and put at risk, might I say, and I hope it isn't put at risk, frankly, put at risk uh, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the debate on the measure about which so many uh, the, the workplace relations measure which ab about which so many have uh, a number of great concerns. Um, finally, I would like to associate myself uh, with others in expressing deep appreciation of the courageous efforts made by uh, the Parliament House staff. Uh, the police and protective services uh, members uh, in defence of this place, our place, and the people's place. And, uh, uh, and I join with the outrage that has been expressed here uh, that so many were injured and one even hospitalised. And I would like to extend uh, my hope uh, for their speedy recovery. And, uh, along with your prayer, Madam President, uh, that uh, God's healing grace may re re renew them and indeed all of us within this uh, great nation of ours. The question is that the Senate take note of the statement. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Hill. Uh, Madam President, uh, I remind the Senate the time has come when it is necessary for the Senate to choose one of its members to be Deputy President and Chairman of Committees. Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, uh, I propose to the Senate for its uh, Deputy President and uh, Chairman of Committees, Senator Sue West, yeah. 
and I move that Senator West be appointed Deputy President and Chairman of Committees. Madam President, uh, speaking uh, to the motion, let me say that there are now uh, some doubts that Senator West uh, will be uh, elected as Deputy President of the Senate. Let me say that Senator West is the unanimous choice of the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party for this position. Let me say that her credentials were endorsed for this position uh, unopposed by the opposition. The Labor Party unanimously believes that Senator West is the best person for this job. Madam President, needless to say, no other candidate put their name forward for consideration before the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party. I want to say this. I want to say this. That uh, I think I think Senator Sue West is a well liked and much respected member of this chamber who, if elected, would bring great credit to the position of Deputy President. And I want to say to you, Sue, on behalf of the opposition, and, and I want to, to Sue, I want to say this very, very clearly. I want to assure you that today's machinations are no reflection at all on the high regard with which every member of the Labor Party and the opposition holds you. I'd uh, remind the Senate that over the years there has been a, uh, a general principle, and I accept uh, there have been some— and I, and I, and I actually accept, and I actually Order. accept, Order. Madam Deputy President, that there have been uh, some hiccups in this along the way. That the Deputy President, that the Deputy President of the Senate, come from the major opposition party. Order. The Labor Party, the Labor Party, has embraced the principle that the president comes from the party of government and the deputy president comes from the major party of opposition. And I, I, I want to I'll respond to that interjection of when did I dream that up, Madam Deputy President. Order. Because as, as, as you would know, as you would know, on the retirement of Senator Sybra, uh, when the issue of the presidency came up, and yet again there were discussions uh, around the chamber about the process of electing his replacement, the Labor Party, through its leader, at that time the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Evans, wrote to the then leader of the opposition, Senator Hill, uh, outlining the principle, Order. outlining the principle that uh, that we believe in in relation to this, and seeking an assurance that uh, that would be honoured in the future. And I seek leave, uh, uh, Madam uh, President, to in fact incorporate that letter in Hansard. Is leave granted? And leave is granted. Thank you, uh, and I thank the Senate. That letter from Senator Evans uh, says this. This is to confirm my statement to you last week that the Australian Labor Party accepts the principle that the party of government should hold the presidency of the Senate and that the main opposition party or coalition should hold the deputy presidency and that we vote accordingly when these questions arise again in the future. And, uh, and I might say that the coalition, 
Order. that the coalition did not question that principle at that time and until today have never have never questioned that principle in this place until today have never questioned that principle in this place and 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 madam president the record stands on this the record stands on this and 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 we say and we say Order. Order. madam uh, president that Order. when you were elected as the deputy president of this place some time ago that was a clear confirmation on the part of the labor party that that principle uh, was uh, one that we followed and will continue to follow, as was seen, of course, with your uh, election as president uh, this morning. I say, uh, Madam Order. President, there's far too much conversation. That, uh, Senator, that Faulkner. Senator West, I think, is is a very well liked and well respected uh, senator in this chamber senator in this chamber who who was uh, of course uh, first elected uh, for a very brief time uh, in 1987 and uh, i think i think it is fair to, to put on record that there have been for senator west some ups and downs in terms of her political career because she of course uh, lost her seat uh, at the she lost she she, she, she lost her seat in the subsequent uh, election, but I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to say, because of the very high regard and respect that she was held in throughout New South Wales, that she was actually able to defeat uh, former Senator Chris Puplick, at that time uh, a senior member of the coalition uh, front bench. Narrow margin again, of course, uh, Senator West. My recollection was 490 votes uh, at the time, but, uh, but uh, to, 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 uh, to win that position, and, uh, and I think since that time, uh, has made a very significant contribution in this place uh, in, in many roles, but certainly has shown uh, a real dexterity with her work uh, as a temporary chairman uh, of committees. And it's for those reasons uh, that Senator West was the unanimous choice of the Federal Parliamentary uh, Labor Party. And uh, it, uh, it is for those uh, re reasons, uh, Madam President, uh, in accordance uh, with the principle that uh, uh, has been unquestioned uh, by, the op uh, by, the, uh, by the coalition until today, over uh, recent years, that, uh, that that uh, the opposition that uh, the opposition in accordance with convention puts forward for the consideration of the senate the outstanding candidature for the position of deputy president and chairman of committees of senator sue west order are there any further nominations senator knowles thank you um, madam president I Order. propose to the Senate for its Deputy President and Chairman of Committee, Senator Colston, and I move that Senator Colston be appointed Deputy President and Chairman of Committees. In so doing, uh, Madam President, I nominate Senator Colston, who is the same Senator who was elected Order. by this Order. chamber and supported by the Labor Party in 1990 against the nominee of the then opposition parties. We believe that Senator Order. Colston has clearly demonstrated Order. Order. Just... Order. A... We believe, Madam President, that Senator Colston has demonstrated a clear capacity for this position over his many years of service. Are there any further nominations? There being two nominations, 
in accordance with standing orders. Order. There being two nominations, in accordance with standing orders, a ballot will be held. Um, but before proceeding to the ballot, the bells will be rung for four minutes. Ring the bells. Point of order, Senator Faulkner. Point of order, order. order. Um, Senator Faulkner. I, I just asked the point, point of order, order. whether. whether uh, it would not be appropriate before the bells are rung for the holding of a ballot that you ask the senators concerned whether they intend to submit themselves to the ballot. I think that would be a very good idea. I Senator West. I submit myself to the will of the Senate. Thank you. Senator Colston. Madam President, I submit myself to the will of the Senate. Ring the bells. Point of order. Uh, Point of order, ma Madam President. I realise the division bells are ringing. Senator uh, Faulkner. Do I have your indulgence to take a point of order at this time or at the conclusion of the? Yeah. I'm happy to do it at the yes. conclusion when the bells have rung. I'll do it then. Point of order. Thank you, Madam uh, President. Senator a point Faulkner. of order I take uh, relates to the procedures of this place, in particular to the issue of pairing. Uh, uh, on today's, uh, uh, today's pairing letter, uh, uh, signed by Senator Panitza, John H. Panitza, the government uh, um, whip, uh, we have uh, an indication that two opposition senators um, have been paired for, uh, for 
the period that covers uh, this particular time of the deputy presidency uh, for deputy presidency ballot uh, in this chamber. Order. Senator, through you, through you, uh, Madam President, Senator Foreman has been paired all day because Senator Foreman is recovering from a serious operation. Through you, Madam Deputy President, Senator Sherry has been paired uh, from 2 o'clock to 7.30 this day for a different reason. He was sworn in, as you know, earlier today. He is currently uh, in the he is he is currently in the budget locker. There is no secret about that. Order. The sh Senator. Order. Senator. Order. Senator Sherry. Would it be more appropriate just to seek leave to make a short statement on this matter? I think it would. I seek leave to make a short statement on the matter instead of a point of order. I want to make a short statement as opposed to a point of order. I'm asking, I'm seeking leave to make a short statement. On is that. leave granted? Senator Sherry was kind to go Order. It is important that I hear what Senator Faulkner has to say. Senator oh, I thank you. Uh, I thank you, uh, Madam President. And as I indicated, Senator Sherry is absent at this time because he is currently in the budget locker. Now we do have here a letter on Senator Panizza, the government whip's uh, letterhead, saying I'd be pleased if you confirm the pairs are set out on the attachment in this letter for Tuesday, the 20th of August, and uh, by signing the acknowledgement. Senator Foreman, all day. Senator Sherry, two o'clock to 7:30 p.m. And see, what we have now is a slimy, sleazy little trick uh, from from the government. Not satisfied with breaking the convention in relation to the election of uh, presidents and deputy presidents of this place, but now taking the unprecedented, now taking the unprecedented step because Senator Pitt Panitza has indicated to the opposition whip that Senator Hill, Senator Hill, who has too gutless to stand up in the earlier debate and nominate Senator Colston, who was too gutless but passed the ball back to a member of his back bench because he didn't have the courage of his convictions. He didn't have the ticker. He didn't have the intestinal Order. fortitude to stand up Order. in this place and, uh, and put forward his own sleazy deal and arrangement. That's because Senator Hill has indicated to Senator Panizza that the long-standing principle of pairs in this chamber is going to be broken. That's the, sort, that's the sort of approach that we now see from the government in this place. As we now see from the government in this place. Order. We, we, we had, I might say, uh, Madam, uh, Madam President, we had yesterday a meeting of, uh, of uh, uh, whips, uh, leaders and managers in this place where Senator Hill talked about a new framework of cooperation in the chamber. A new framework of cooperation, and I think it is fair to say to, to Senator Brown, uh, um, uh, Senator, Senator Margetts, uh, Senator Harradine and Senator Curnow, uh, those uh, three senators who attended that, uh, that meeting, that that was put forward as a new and more constructive and more sensible approach from this mob over here in government. And I want to say to the minor parties and independents in this place, this breach of convention, but now this absolutely contemptible and despicable, despicable and low breach of all process and procedures in this place ought to be condemned by every single senator. See what we've got, what we've got. The word of this government and its office holders in this place is worth nothing. Their word is worth nothing. They are deceivers. They deceived us. They deceived, they, they deceived this opposition. You simply, barefacedly, Senator Lyon. Point of order. Point of order, Senator Newman. Well, actually, I've got two points, uh, Madam President. The first is that the first is that the leader. The first
first is that the Leader of the Opposition is shouting in a chamber which is already has perfectly, Order. perfectly adequate amplification. We can hear him very well. If you'd ask him please not to shout and deafen everybody. And secondly, he, secondly he, sought leave, he sought leave to make a statement after he'd originally got up to uh, uh, simply make a point of order. He's been given the indulgence of the Senate to make a statement. He's now ferociously, ferociously debating something. With, he was making ferocious argument on something which, by most standards, would not be described as a statement, and I ask him to keep bring it to an end. My statement, Madam Senator, Deputy. This, order. Madam President. Just a moment, please. There is far too much interjection and conversation in the chamber. Senator Faulkner. Madam President, this is a serious issue. This is a serious issue. And long standing and experienced senators who understand what convention is about, who understand what parliamentary process and procedure is about, I think will agree with what I am saying. You cannot operate in a parliament like this. You cannot operate in a parliament like this where no one party, where no one party has a majority. Order. Where votes are tight, where there is a need for negotiation between the political parties, between the opposition and the government and minor parties and independents on a very regular basis, you cannot operate in this sort of atmosphere with this level of deceit, with this level of deceit from senior office holders in the government. And I want to say this. I, I want to say this. I don't blame you, Senator Panizza. You are not responsible Senator for Faulkner, this. Address your remarks through the chair. I please. want to say this, uh, Madam President. It is not Senator Panizza's responsibility. The person who is responsible for this despicable decision is Senator Hill. Senator Hill, who 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 Senator Hill, who has indicated through his whip to Senator Collins, Senator Collins, to the government whip that pairs will be not granted for this ballot. Well, well, I want to say, I want to say, Senator Collins, Senator Collins, please remain silent that the Prime Minister of this country gave, gave one solemn assurance to the Australian people that perhaps he intends to keep. Perhaps he intends to keep. Maybe, maybe he was serious when he made the commitment he would do something about parliamentary behaviour and parliamentary standards. But everything that we have seen in this place since that commitment was given indicates that the processes, the procedures, the standing orders, the sessional orders, the conventions of this place mean nothing to John Howard and his government. Nothing at all. And today, not only is the convention broken in relation to the presidency and the deputy presidency of this place, not only is that broken, but we have, but we have a formal communication Order from the government whip that pairs will not be granted in what are clear circumstances of two opposition senators being able to attend this, uh, this chamber at this time for this particular ballot. No reasonable person would accept what has just been communicated uh, from uh, the government in relation to this matter. I think even someone as weak as you, Robert, as weak as you, Order. as weak as you, Senator Faulkner, even someone as weak the as the leader of the government, perhaps now, yeah, yellow-bellied and spineless, ought to reconsider Senator your Faulkner, position. I'd ask you to withdraw that remark. I, I withdraw that. Even someone as uh, as weak as Senator Hill ought to, ought to really, re really think very hard about the new precedence that he's creating and get back here, apologise for your behaviour and get some proper process underway in this place. Yes, yes, well said. The same matter.
Is leave granted? When's the last time you read a order. Order. Senator Coates was on his feet first on this occasion. Is leave granted to Senator Coates to make a statement on the same matter? Very Senator briefly. Coates. I'm not going to make the statement that I was planning to make this afternoon at this stage, but on this particular matter, I want to draw the government's attention to a past uh, precedent on the granting, on the granting of, on the, on the granting of pairs. Even, even, even in the situation of the constitutional crisis of 1975, and I know that people don't like going back that far in history, but even at the time of the constitutional crisis in 1975, pairs. Pairs were granted. That, con that, that, con that convention, that convention was obeyed. Then, if order, if, order, if there the, will be an opportunity for other if, senators to contribute. If the, if, the, if the Whitlam government in the Senate at the time had chosen to break the convention of pairs, the appropriation bills in 1975 could have been passed. And I would just ask, ask the, ask the government. To think very seriously about the sort of precedent they're setting here. Order, Senator, Senator Hill. Um, Madam, uh, Madam President, there are a few things. If I might seek leave to uh, make a brief statement. Is leave statement. granted? There being no objection, Senator and Hill. I won't, uh, I won't seek to shout down the other side. The, uh, the reason I, I'm, uh, there is the difficulty in this matter, of course, is 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 not an issue Order. of. Is how you give pairs, how you give pairs on a secret ballot. How do you? Well, as I understand it, what right have you got? No, why don't you listen? Order. Order. Well, they think if they, if they, they think if they laugh and giggle, it makes the, it makes their case. But, Madam President, if you just, if they might just. Cease for a moment and listen to the order and listen to the argument. So, Senator Hill, just wait. Senator Collins, please allow Senator Hill to be heard. You can have your opportunity later. Senator Hill. Pairs, pairs, as I understand it, are not a process of the standing orders. They are an arrangement between the parties. The parties. Party party votes. And what is said in giving a pair is that on votes before the Senate, pairs will be acknowledged, as has been, as has been demonstrated in the letter given by Senator Panizza. This is not a, this is not a vote within the Senate. This is a ballot. No, no, no. You, why don't you listen? This is, this is a ballot. Senator Collins. This is, this is a... Order. 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 Senator Hill. The Labor Party understands, that, Madam President, that on votes within the Senate, everyone divisions, everyone gets gets counted. They are identified. They are identified and counted, and that's why you can give pairs. But in a secret ballot, how can you give pairs when you have no right to determine the way? Any individual is going to vote, and that's why. Order. Order. And that's why I understand, Madam, Madam President, that contrary to what the leader of the opposition said, pairs are never given in secret ballots. Very obvious reason, but it doesn't suit his purposes at the moment to recognise the argument of the logic. No, that's. A, conve a convention. It's a bit like his previous. It's a bit like his previous speech, Madam President. It's a convention, except in 1990, when it doesn't suit his purposes. Here he says it's a convention. Here he says. Order. Here he just, says it's a. Oh, just a moment, Senator Hill. There is far too much interjection in the chamber as a whole, and it makes it difficult for anybody to hear. Senator Hill. He knows it not only is a convention. But I have no doubt that the advice that he would have received is the advice that I received, and that is if circumstances in which there has been an effort to apply pairs for a secret ballot has not ever occurred in the past. So far, so far from being a convention, it is not the practice, and it is not the practice for the very logical reason that I have just put to you. 
Nevertheless, I must say that I've got no, uh, I've got no sympathy for Senator Sherry at all. He, he chose to decide to go to a lock-up rather than, rather than vote for his colleague. He made that, he made that, uh, he made that choice. He made that choice. However, I do have order, Senator Collins. I am, I am, I am concerned about the position of Senator. Order. I am concerned about the position of Senator Foreman, and I do think that it is a. Order, Senator Hill. I do think it's an unsatisfactory aspect of this uh, of this matter. Well, what I'm, going to, what I'm going to do is say that although we cannot give pairs, I, and, and I do it reluctantly because, in effect, individuals have become identified with a particular voting intention, I will, I will, I will nevertheless call Order. for two of my colleagues to absent themselves from this ballot. Now, if that occurs, when that occurs, Oh, you see, you are never satisfied. Whatever we do will not satisfy you. Well, here, here we are bending over backwards to be fair and reasonable. We are actually, we are actually Order. Far, from, Order. far from breaking a convention. We are actually creating a precedent, and I'm sure there'll be plenty that'll say there'll be plenty who say that is undesirable. But we want this vote to be seen, not only to be fair, but to be seen to be fair. And, and I don't think that we can. Be, I think we are going far beyond not only what has ever occurred before, but what any reasonable person would say is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Senator Ray. Seek to make a statement on the same subject. Is leave granted, Senator Ray? I wish to uh, rise to congratulate Senator Faulkner for raising this issue because had he, had he not raised it had he not raised it in such a forceful manner he would not have of course had senator hill make his most recent concession of course the point about pairing pairing is about who comes in when the bells ring it's not about secret ballot at all it's who comes into the chamber when the bells ring as the result of pairing and it's for that reason that when senator Peneza signed his uh, name to the pairs list that two Liberals should have been paired from coming in at the division bells, and he knows it. And I'm, uh, I'm a bit sad. I'm a bit sad, Madam President. I'm a bit sad Order. that he's been so shamed here today through probably no, no connivance of his own. Through no connivance of his own, he's been shamed in this chamber. And when the word of a whip, when the word of a whip is devalued, this whole chamber does not work very well, and you sitting in that chair would know it better than most for the enormous service you gave in this chamber as a sensible whip. There are many standing orders in the book here, but the first standing order always should be common sense. We, uh, we pointed out—let me give you an example from history—how what goes around comes around. Let's just point it out. Order. A few years ago, a few years ago, Madam, De uh, Madam President, a variety of coalition members missed a division here because they lingered too long over their dinner. I know that because, in fact, I passed them all. And can you believe that? On the way to this chamber for that division, and I made it by 20 seconds. They all hit the door running, Madam President, when the door slammed in their faces. And we won that particular division on a crucial amendment. And what was our response in government? Not to rely on, on past practice, not to rely on what was in standing orders, but institute the law of common sense. And I recommitted that clause, and we were defeated by one vote. The next time this happened, the next time, Madam President, this happened, we were at fault. We were at fault. And we lost the division we should have won. What happened? The other side here said, no, you can't recommit it. We won't let it. And we have to move 12 divisions in a row to get that original vote restored. And I warned you at that occasion you were setting precedents. And what happened a few months later? Again, they missed divisions. Did we force another 12 divisions on this chamber? No. We instituted the law of common sense. 
and had that clause recommitted. John Howard, who's won this particular federal election on one of his platforms, was better parliamentary behaviour. Well, what a great start today. What a great start to parliamentary behaviour we've seen from Senator Hill and his cohorts in this particular chamber. What we've seen is they say there is no convention on the electing of a deputy president. The fact is, let us put it on the record, till 1990 all ballots were contested, even though people knew the result in advance. So even though the government had president, they still ran candidates against the presidential candidate. We, as government, ran candidates against their deputy president. But circumstances did change because in a discussion, and he can get up and deny it if he wants to, between Senator Hill and Senator Evans, Senator Hill asked what the future convention was going to be. And I thought he was very wise at the time because not only did he accept Garrett's word on it, he said, go away and put it in writing. And what you've seen Point of order, Senator Harrity. Uh, Madam President, uh, the matter before the chamber is the question of peers. And uh, Senator, um, yes it is, Se you did last lead to make a statement about the matter. And the matter is a matter of peers. It is not about uh, uh, the question of, uh, of precedent in respect of who should be uh, appointed deputy or not. I would suggest, Madam uh, President, that uh, Senator Ray confine his remarks to the matter before the chair. Order. Senator Faulkner. Uh, on the point of order, uh, Madam uh, President, I think you'll find the record shows that uh, Senator Ray sought leave to make a statement. Leave was granted, and I think he's making the statement. I believe he's in order. Senator point of Ray. order, uh, I, will, I will concede. Even, uh, from memory or otherwise, that I asked to make, uh, sought leave to make a statement on the matter, as Senator Harradine says. However, Senator, uh, speaking to the point of order, what I'm talking about, Senator Harradine, is the importance of precedence. And this is an analogy on precedence, the same as Pears is. And so your point of order, I have to say, with due respect, has no relevance here. I'm linking the two together. Precedence on, vote, on granting Pears and precedence on, I know you don't want to hear this. So I'll, I'll, I'll await your ruling, Madam Chair, before I continue. I think Senator Ray is generally talking to the topic that was raised initially by Senator Faulkner and would allow you to proceed. The circumstances I outlined, uh, and that they were when Senator Bean was to be elevated to the chair, Senator Hill and Senator Evans, I don't know at whose initiative, had a conversation about precedence for these positions. And Senator Hill very, I think, sensibly asked for Senator Evans to put the Labor Party, then government's view, in writing, which he did, which has been incorporated today. At no stage from that point, right up till today, has Senator Hill indicated, that the, on behalf of the coalition, that they didn't accept that as the position. So, in actual fact, when they claim that 1990 is an aberration on precedence, the real precedence was set, was set from the allocation of that letter. And what happened since? When Senator Crichton Brown, absolutely. Maybe, maybe, maybe Senator Hill told no, none of his colleagues. Maybe he didn't tell them about the conversation. Maybe he didn't appraise them of the letter. But what a great start to the John Howard government, the higher parliamentary privilege uh, uh, behavioural standards, when basically they rat on any precedent when it suits them. Now, I come back to that point of common sense, and I can tell you unequivocally, as a former manager of government business, if in one of these ballots you had someone in hospital uh, suffering from an operation or someone that required to be in a lockup, I would have made sure you were granted a pair for that, and you know it. And until you were challenged on this today, and until you made your decision on the run, you basically, Senator Hill, disgraced Senator Panizza. He put his signature to a thing, and I'll tell you this for you, Madam President. Order. Senator Panizza, if your word is worthless in this place, or made worthless, this place doesn't operate. This place does operate on the basis of numbers about one quarter of the time. The rest of the time, 
It operates through leave, consensus and cooperation. This place wouldn't even work without the hard work that whips do, for all the stars that are here on front benches, etc. The real nitty-gritty organisation is done by the whips. And we will remember this day for a long while. We will remember the sort of implicit treachery that was involved in this decision. And we'll remember that we got it reversed because you've got a weak leader who can't do his own dirty work. A weak leader that can't do his own dirty work. Now, Madam uh, President, Senator, Order. Hill, Order. Senator Hill has at least gone some way to rectifying what I think was going to be a serious long-term problem in this place. And I find it impossible to, hit, to think that if, in fact, they weren't going to grant pairs for this ballot, they wouldn't have mentioned it at the Whips meeting this morning. I mean, really? Didn't Senator Panizza think to say, look, sure, we're granting two whips all day. We know one's in hospital and one's in the lockup. But incidentally, you won't be able to vote in the secret ballot. I mean, he did not once, apparently, mention that. You've got to ask yourself why. Order. Was he ambushed by his leader and others? Or was he, in fact, was he, in fact planning this all along? We'd like to hear from Senator Panizza on this because prior to this he's had an unblemished reputation in terms of being a stickler to the rules in this particular chamber. Oh, you've had enough time, have we, Senator Newman? Order. You know, you know, Stick to the matter, don't Senator tempt me, Ray. Senator Newman. I, I, I do have an unlimited amount of time at my disposal, but I don't want to use that up right to the, uh, right to the crunch point. Now, in summary, Madam President, this has been a pretty sad day, not only for this chamber, but as it turns out for you. The precedents have been broken. A candidate that was unanimously endorsed by their parliamentary party will be, in all probability, rejected. And in the end, that's going to badly reflect on the chair and the attitude to, and the, attitude to the chair. And whatever mistakes were made in 1990 were rectified in the next ballot when we did not oppose the, the candidate and we had every intention of voting for that particular candidate. So, as I've said in this chamber a couple of times, the Liberal Party or the Coalition will have its fun today, it will have some joy today, but in the end it will pay the price for this. Senator McGibbon, <coughs> you seek leave to I seek leave to make a statement, Madam President. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McGibbon. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I just want to be very brief on this, but I must correct Senator Ray on this. And I must say I'm saddened that Senator Ray, who has been one of the sticklers for procedures in this chamber and probably the only member of the Labor Party who has any respect for the institution of the Senate and the Parliament, should have made a misstatement the way he did, where he said that when pairs are granted, you are debarred from entering the chamber. There's a point of view that if you are within the building and you are paired, you do appear in the chamber and you stand beside, behind the uh, seats here so that your presence is noted. And it's quite incorrect to say that you are debarred from entering the chamber. But this debate has got very muddled on the point of a secret ballot as opposed to a division. Senator Hill is perfectly correct. If we have a secret ballot, we have it so that people do not know how they're going to vote, and therefore you can't make a prediction on how they're going to vote. And the final point in conclusion is the crocodile tears of Senator Ray about breaking precedent. Well, on a far more serious matter was the matter of the division of the Senate into short and long-term senators after the 1987 double dissolution, where Senator Ray, as leader of the government, or well, the manager of government business at the time, conspired with the Democrats to rot the system insofar as they broke with the precedent since Federation and they took the plum jobs. They took the long-term Senate positions for the Labor Party and the Democrats so that in the hope in the subsequent election they would be able to get control of the Senate. Well, fortunately, the public made their judgment of the standing of the Democrats and the Labor Party in the 1990 election, and of course they lost seats and they didn't get control. But the rorting of the convention that uh, senators be distributed into short and long-term positions in the sequence in which they were elected 
The sequence that had been followed since Federation was a far more profound breach of convention than anything that's going on or implied to be going on here today. Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. Uh, I seek leave to. Uh... Is leave granted to Senator Cook to make a statement? L leave is not granted. Leave is not granted. Order. Order. Leave has not been granted to Senator Cook to make a statement. Uh, Madam uh, uh, President, uh, can I therefore move the, that to so much of standing orders be suspended in order to enable to me oh, in, in yes. order to able, enable me to make a statement? The question is that standing orders be suspended to enable Senator Cook well, to make a statement. Madam, uh, um, Madam President, the reason why I move uh, this way is that uh, it would have been, I think, more reasonable for, noted, for some senators who dissented from me speaking before to not have so dissented. But uh, this is a debate which touches on the very foundation of this Senate, that is how we elect officers of this chamber to preside over this chamber and bring order to this chamber and uh, structure the debate and proceedings of this chamber in a way and in a manner in which it will be orderly. It seems to me that for anyone to be denied to speak on such a matter is in fact to suppress the opinion of senators in this chamber by weight of numbers rather than open the proceedings of this chamber for the free flow of, uh, of uh, debate and, and so that all of us, when this matter is finally resolved as it eventually will, can at least feel that we had our say and had our opportunity to put our views to this chamber. And therefore, I think that uh, uh, the, the uh, suspension of standing orders ought to be, uh, ought to be supported. You see, what, uh, what has been said uh, in this debate uh, by a number of speakers is true. The Prime Minister promised the electorate of Australia, when he was elected, that he would bring a better order and governance to the affairs of parliament. What we have seen today is something that has been, in my view, rightly described as a low, sleazy move, and it is uh, to break a long-standing convention of the parliament. And I just ask the Senate for a, I just ask the Senate for a moment to consider uh, when we have got bills of high public controversy in the wings waiting to come on in here, that if the proceedings in electing the presiding officers of this chamber, I now refer to the deputy president, not the president. Uh, if the proceedings are, are subverted, Order. then the authority that those officers might bring to their high and esteemed office will also be equally subverted, and will also Order. be equally subverted. Senator, and uh, Senator no interjections, no Senator, interjections Senator from you, Campbell. Senator Campbell, will, uh, will that subvert remark, that please? point. You see. Order, Senator Cook. Senator Campbell, would you withdraw that remark? 1990. He didn't support the, this convention. He calls a convention. I ask you to withdraw. Hypocrite is the most descriptive word to describe this senator. I ask you to withdraw that word. I withdraw. Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting, uh, uh, Madam President, and might I say I'm very pleased to be able to address you in that in that term. But it does come down to, to at the end of the day, respect for the institutions of this Parliament. And if uh, sleazy deals are entered into, as this, as this apparently is the case on this occasion, then the officers that are finally elected by that means carry no honour into their office, and they risk the opportunity of, uh, of their, their rulings and their authority being undermined by that. It is very important, it's very important that conventions which hold this place together and give it form and give it authority be adhered to in, the, in these proceedings. That is not what's happening today. And Point of order, Senator Crane. Senator Cook. Order, Se Senator, Senator Panizza. Order, Senator Panizza, you're standing between the speaker and the chair. S Senator, Senator Cook sought leave to make a statement. It was not granted. He then moved a motion to explain to this Senate why uh, there should be a suspension of standing orders. Now he has not once in the time that he's been talking, addressed why standing orders should be suspended. Senator Kemp, so I would Senator Kemp, you're standing between the Speaker and the Chair. So, Madam Chair, I would ask that you ask him to come to the uh, what he's moved to do, or to sit down. 
because it is absolutely essential in terms of this. And he's talking about the requirement to run this place properly and do it in order. And every word he has said in terms of what he's done has been in total breach of the standing orders of this place. Senator Cook, you have a limited time to apply yourself to this. On the point of order, can I just say, uh, uh, Madam President, that I, I have related my remarks to the suspension order. motion on a number of occasions. But let me just let me make it through you. Let me just say to Senator Winston Crane that what we're about to do is engage in the election of the deputy president of this chamber. That I am offended by the moves that have been made to break a long-standing convention of this chamber, and I'm entitled, as a senator elected in this place from the same state as you, Senator Winston Crane, to have a say about that matter. And if you wish to deny me the right to have a say then you can expect that I will protest in every way order. possible under standing Senator, orders. Time for and any senator with dignity would do so. Well, senator Cook, the time to participate has expired. We, senator Harradine. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'd be quite happy to support the suspension of standing orders. Uh, I don't know why the, government, uh, why the opposition is uh, proposing it, because uh, I thought that they had a very important MPI to be debated today, and that is the question of uh, the reduction in funds for the ABC. But uh, I, I, I would be very pleased. I'd be very pleased to support the uh, uh, suspension of standing orders, uh, provided uh, that I'm given an assurance that the um, by somebody who is supporting the suspension uh, uh, that uh, you will address this particular question, and that is uh, uh, the issue that has been raised by S Senator Hill. Uh, Senator Hill has said, how can you give pairs for a secret ballot? I mean, how do people maybe, uh, I mean, uh, in a situation, I mean, the problem is not with uh, giving pairs, the problem is with the standing orders and what they say about how the ballot will take place. Now, that's the, that's the, that's the point. And, um, uh, Madam uh, President, I hope the I, I, I hope I'm relevant. I hope that they might be able to tell me uh, how we're going to get over that situation before I uh, vote for the suspension of standing orders. The problem is with the way the standing orders are written in respect of the ballot. I mean, there's no provision in there uh, for a postal ballot. Well, every person in this country, every elector in this country, can have a postal ballot if they're not there. I mean, Dominic, and my best wishes to you, Dominic, uh, could have a postal ballot if it was a, um, uh, a, an election uh, for, uh, for us to this place. But it's odd that we can't have a postal ballot. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, the nominations take place immediately before the ballot takes place. Well, there mightn't be two. I mean, how can you give uh, pairs when there mightn't be two? Uh, Candidates. There might be three. There might be five candidates. Now, um, well, no, 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 no. Uh, it's particularly point my say for the Democrats and those of us who, who may not be uh, aware that uh, uh, that there is one or two uh, people or five people. So it really is. You know, I respectfully, eh? Stephen. Uh, yeah, but. There again, with all due respects, uh, Order. with all, the, all due respects, the nomination of Senator Colston uh, came upon us suddenly, and uh, and uh, the the whip may not have even known that uh, uh, there was going to be a, a second uh, uh, a second candidate. So, order. Oh well, uh, but uh, I would hope that uh, anyone from the opposition who is. Uh, speaking and eating up more time from the ABC debate uh, might uh, answer the question, because I believe the problem is in the standing orders in relation uh, to uh, uh, this particular matter. And I understand what Senator Hill has uh, said. He's been in a difficult position. And frankly, if we, if we allow pairs and I've been thinking about this. If we allow pairs on this occasion for a secret ballot, then that is uh, establishing a, prince, uh, a precedent. As far as I can recall in my time here, it's never happened before. I think the offer that Senator Hill has made has been a generous offer for a couple of their side to get lost whilst we get on with the ballot. 
The question is that the so standing orders be suspended to enable Senator Cook to speak by, by leave. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion to provide that the ballot for deputy president be deferred until all senators are present. Now, uh, now I, move, uh, I move this uh, motion because uh, I, I, do take, I do take up the challenge that, uh, that Senator Harradine has directed to the Senate. And I hope that Senator Harradine would agree that this is a, this is this 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 is uh, this is well this is both uh, a creative and sensible uh, approach in this circumstance because we have heard we have heard at great length Order. about the sanctity we have we have heard at great length about the sanctity of the uh, the secret ballot and of course uh, even suggestions now from the government we don't know how these two uh, these two uh, senators that uh, Senator Hill offers might leave uh, the chamber. And it seems to me that uh, given that we have elected a president, given that we have a very adequate, a very adequate system of temporary chairman of uh, committees in this play, place and acting uh, deputy presidents in this place, we do have an opportunity for uh, a creative approach on this particular issue. And I must and, uh, and I must say that there's been talk about uh, setting, uh, setting new precedent. Well, quite obviously, quite obviously, the way to go here is to have a ballot when all 76 senators are present. And I want to say this. I want to say this to you. We have seen today one of the sleaziest, one of the sleaziest, most deceitful pieces of politics that has, that has ever been perpetrated in this place. And we've only seen it because Senator Hill has been so weak and spineless in failing, in failing to back the opposition, the relevant opposition office holder, uh, government office holder, who gave, who gave the opposition uh, commitments. That's Senator Panitza, in failing to back Senator Panitza up in terms of the commitments that he gave. So I do believe, uh, Madam Acting Deputy order, President, order. that the that the that uh, that uh, if the, if the government are fair income, that they want to see that they want to see all senators have an opportunity to vote, and the Labor Party has made very clear our position in regard to this uh, particular matter. Then the way to allow that is to have this particular ballot, to have this particular ballot when all senators are present. Because don't forget this. You've seen a very sneaky, very, very, very sneaky, low-life performance from the government today. And this is a government. This is a government that was elected on a platform of bringing a new standard, a new standard into the, the processes of the parliament uh, uh, and Mr Howard gave uh, yet another uh, so-called ironclad or solid commitment to the Australian people. He would do something serious. He would do something serious about seeing, about seeing uh, this uh, standards in this place improve. And what have we seen? Every convention broken. Every possible convention broken. Every possible trick in the book from the bottom of the pack. Order. From the bottom of the pack perpetrated by this crew on the other side of the chamber. And if you are fair income, if you are fair income about seeing the will of the Senate prevail on this issue, and if you are fair income about seeing the uh, uh, the uh, the word that's been given the, the word that's been given by the relevant opposition holder, office holder, Senator Panitza, honoured, then the only way through is simply to have a ballot with all 76 senators present, and uh, we can have obviously a very clear and fair dinkum, fair dinkum uh, assessment of what the uh, the real position is in this chamber. 
So let's. Uh, but, the, but the reality, the reality is, Madam Deputy President, that we've we've been given the word of the government. The government's words been shown to be worthless. They have deceived us. They have betrayed us. They have lied to us. They, your, you, you, Senator Panizza, have lost all credibility in this place. We can never take your word for anything. We can never take your word for anything. Procedures and processes have broken down, and the only way through is to get all 76 senators in this place, cast their ballot for the deputy president, and then we'll know without tricks. Without tricks, Order, Senator, without sleeves, Senator without Faulkner, slime, Senator without Faulkner, deceit, your time we will know expired. what the will of the Senate is. Senator Alston. Thank Order. You. Before Thank you start speaking, Senator, we like a little more order in the chamber. But senators standing up, please take their seats. Senator Alston. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, this is an absolute shambles. If ever the moral, the moral and intellectual inadequacies of an opposition leader have been exposed. It is today. He, he, he got himself worked up into a fury with uh, confected outrage about us doing what they did in 1990. He c complained bitterly about Senator Knowles, who is a good friend of Senator Colson's, actually having the cheek to nominate him. And then, of course, we had all this outrage about the fact that somehow you can equate pairs in a secret ballot with uh, normal pairs in a division, where the vote is quite transparent. And as Senator Harradine uh, made so very clear, it's uh, a fundamental difference. And the opposition has clearly declined to answer the point. And uh, not only that, of course, what we've had is a, an extraordinary concession that somehow that argument is unanswerable. So all of this outrage is now out the window, and what are we left with? A proposition that uh, we should adjourn until such time as everyone is present. Now, what does that mean? I mean, take an anarchist like Senator Carr, who's going to be very unhappy at democracy prevailing. What if he chooses to absent himself from the chamber? We'd never get around to a vote on this issue. I mean, it is an absolutely ludicrous proposition. The trouble is, you see, Labor is a victim of its own tyranny. They have never accepted the concept of a secret ballot. They can't understand how anyone can't toe the party line. You get the chop. You get expelled from the party if you actually vote against them. The very reason they bring in show and tell is because they don't accept the legitimacy of people exercising their own personal vote. And yet, as we know, the standing orders don't provide for pairs for the very simple reason that people ought to be entitled to exercise a personal view on who they want as their presiding officers in this parliament. And yet what we're, what we're being given is a demonstration of Labor's absolute intolerance, not only of dissent, but of anyone who would dare to challenge the, uh, the rule, the iron law, of uh, those in charge of the party. Now, it doesn't work that way. The Senate was not designed to accommodate that system. It's a private arrangement. As you know, pairs are there for the convenience of the parties. They were, they were signed on this day on the usual understanding that they would apply when there were divisions, when there were transparent ballots. They have never, ever been used in this chamber for the purpose of effectively causing a secret ballot to be a non-secret ballot. That's what you're trying to do. And the tragedy is that Senator Faulkner is so bereft of any intellectual ability to cope with the argument about the difference between a secret ballot and an open ballot that he basically has to concede the point, not address it in any shape or form, and come up with something else that the real opposition leader tells him he'd better give a run. Now, that, that is a tragedy, and it certainly uh, pulls the rug out from any of the arguments we've heard this afternoon. I mean, we got very sick of being lectured when we were in opposition about the morality of somehow the wheel will turn and uh, if you don't do the right thing now, you'll suffer in government. We got that lecture from Senator Ray on uh, referring bills to legislation committees, if you recall. That's precisely what he was on about ad nauseam when they were in government. What happened when we came to Telstra and the Australian Workplace Relations Bill? Of course, they were referred off to references committees. And in other words, an absolute and flagrant breach of all that Double Senator standards. Ray lectured us Double about. Standards. What do we find again today? My recollection is if Senator Ray wasn't manager of government business back in 1990, he was certainly a major player. We haven't heard one skerrick, one squeak of a defence about how he justified the, the ballot that uh, is effectively being rerun to, re today. In other words, convention is something that suits him 
in terms of, a, of an intellectual or debating point, it's got nothing to do with the real life as far as the Labor Party is concerned, where you live or die on the strength of numbers. That's all you understand. But we understand secret ballots to have a lot more to them than that. They are an opportunity for people to express their real views. We can't force people to vote, and you shouldn't either. But that's what you're trying to do. You try to ensure that somehow uh, you cut people back. If Senator Sherry chooses to absent himself, you could have explored the consequences of that. You knew full well what was going to take place in this chamber this afternoon. When Senator Hill accommodates you, absolutely, what do you do? You once again want to change the rules so that you've got an absolutely nonsensical proposition now before the chair. I mean, it just simply exposes the way in which you cannot address issues on principle. You can't accept the fact that uh, what's happening now is something that is entirely of your own creation, both internally and externally, and that you ought to wear that result. Democracy is, a lot, Senator, is a lot more healthier than expired. you're prepared to give it credit Sen for. Senator Schott. The resolution. I rise, Madam, Deputy, uh, Madam President, to support the resolution. The suspension of standing orders moved by Senator Faulkner. The point that uh, Sen Senator Alston has not come to grips with is that Senator Foreman, through no fault of his own, I'm sure would absolutely wish to be here today. He has had a serious. He has had a serious. He has had a serious. Uh, he, uh, he, he has a serious illness and uh, is still recuperating from it, Senator Boswell. He would rather be here than uh, recovering from his serious illness. However, because, because no one expected, and I have to say I think these events of having a ballot for the deputy, the deputy uh, president of the Senate only emerged during circumstances today, uh, Senator Foreman, obviously, if he could be here, would like to be here. Now, Senator, Senator Sherry, who was the shadow minister for finance, had arranged for some time, in accordance with those provisions of the budget, to be in the lockup. Now, if we asked for him to come out of the lockup now, you would prevent him from coming out because that would be a breach of the budget confidentiality. Once he's in there, and he went in, I think, at about 12:30. He's locked up. He's locked up. He can't come. He can't come out. So what, what we now have from Senator Hill is a proposal that, look, we don't accept the pairs. You can't have a pair on a secret ballot, but we'll ask two of our people not to vote. Well, if he says that that is not acceptable, that, uh, that that is a strange way to go about having pairs on a secret ballot, then Senator Faulkner's uh, position is the best. Wait till all 76 senators are available to vote. Well, well that, that, they're never here, he says, Senator Fer Madam, uh, Deputy Pr uh, Madam President. Senator Ferguson says they're never here. Well, they're going to have to be here at some stage. That is the only way you will have a creditable election. And I say whoever is elected as, as deputy president, as Senator Cook has said, wants to be elected in a ballot that there is no doubt about. And that's why we are moving the suspension of the why moving this resolution to wait till all 76 turn up. So Senator Hill doesn't have to ask drawing it from the hat, two Liberals to leave the chamber. We don't have to wait for them to ask them to leave the chamber. We, we, we don't have to wait. We don't have, it's not, he said it's not a pair. He said it's not a pair. He has now said it really is unfortunate. So why don't, you, why don't we then, the only way we're going to get a creditable ballot is have all 76, all 76, all 76 senators in here to elect to elect the deputy, the deputy president, because of the machinations of Senator Hill today in overriding the, gov the government, whip, rip up the letter, the agreement which everybody would have accepted, rip that up. He has put his own. He has thrown doubt on this particular ballot. Whoever is elected as whoever is elected as deputy president wouldn't want to be elected with any any doubt, any smear of a doubt that their election is accepted and been above board in accordance not only with the rules of the Senate, the standing orders of the Senate, but the conventions of the Senate. Well, so what we have here, what we have had here is a mess created by the government through its consistent inexperience and trying to be too smart by half. If, if, that, is, that is absolutely the case. It waited until the bells had almost finished being rung 
to call people to have the ballot that Senator Panizza says, oh, gives an indication to the opposition, the pairs are off because Robert Hill, the leader, Senator Hill, the leader of the government, has says they're off. The look on, the look on Senator Panizza's face betrayed the fact that he knew he had been dudded by his leader. So what we have is a chance to say, well, if there's any doubt about there are effective pairs or people have to leave the chamber to make the, the ballot real or not real, why not wait until all 76 senators are in here voting in a secret ballot, which everybody says is the way to do it, rather than asking now, uh, asking now as Senator Hill has created, this unfortunate precedent of this unfortunate precedent of saying, well, we'll find two Liberals and I'll ask them not to vote, but it's really not a pairs process, and therefore throws doubt on the whole process. On this whole process, it has been a very unseemly start to the Senate today, through the sheer incompetence and deception of the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Hill, and he stands condemned as Order. a result. Your time has expired, Senator O'Chi. Madam President. Madam President, the Order. proposal before the Senate, which has been put by Senator Faulkner, lacks any credibility at all. And I draw honourable senators to Chapter 4 of the Standing Orders. As you would well know, Madam President, your duties are not confined to duties in this chamber. Honourable senators should understand that the President exercises the powers of the joint presiding officers, is responsible for the Department of the Senate, and is partly responsible for the running of Parliament House. Now, chapter 4 of the Standing Orders states that where the President is absent, and we hope, Madam President, that you would not be incapacitated or prevented from executing your obligations, but were the President to be, president to be incapacitated, it is absolutely critical that we have a Deputy President who can exercise the powers of the, of the President on her behalf. And if this motion were to be passed, Remembering that Senator Faulkner, the foreman may not be back for some period of time, and the Senate adjourns at the end of the week and does not come back until the beginning of September, there could be a situation where the President was incapacitated during the adjournment of the Senate and there was nobody who could exercise the powers of the presiding officer of the Senate. And that would be a ridiculous situation, an absolutely ridiculous situation. But that is what Senator Faulkner and the government are proposing to honourable senators today. That's now, I take that interjection from Senator Abetz. That just shows that the, the limited extent of Senator Faulkner's wisdom on these matters, because he is more concerned with scoring some cheap party political point than he is in safeguarding the well-being of the parliament and the good standing of the Senate. And honourable senators today have noted, have noted the conduct to which this parliament has been subjected during the course of this week. We cannot have a situation occur where there is nobody who can act on behalf of the Senate during, during, the, adjournment, during the adjournment of the Senate. And Senator Boswell quite rightly correct, uh, interjects, somebody could get sick the next week and the week after that and the week after that. And I'm sure, I'm sure the Labor Party will arrange for a rolling illness. We've had rolling strikes. This will be a rolling illness on the other side. A rolling illness to prevent a vote of this Senate to, to elect a deputy president. They will hold us hostage, as Senator Bowen says. It is only fitting, it is only proper, for the dignity and good order of the Senate and for the maintenance of the supremacy of this parliament that we elect a deputy president here and now today here and now today, and that this Senate should reject the motion by Senator Faulkner and move immediately to this ballot. Senator Carr. Madam uh, President, I uh, rise to support the proposition moved by Senator Faulkner. This is a shambles, as Senator Alston has indicated. It is a shambles because this government can't be trusted. This is a government that is founded upon lies and deceit. This is a government that has made its very political existence founded on the proposition that you can break your election promises, you can do whatever you like, you can say whatever you like, but you do another thing when you get in here. And that is, of course, the course of action being followed. Now, what is the nature of a pair? There's nothing in the standing orders. It's a very simple arrangement. It is a private arrangement between the parties. Like so much that goes on here, 
It's based on trust. So much of what happens in this parliament is based on private negotiation. When Senator Kemp comes to me as the manager of government business and says, this is what we would like to do, I am now supposed to say, we cannot trust you. We cannot rely upon your word because you have been proven to be categorical liars. You make it quite clear that you are morally and intellectually bankrupt. When it comes to the question of morality, you have none. As far as you are concerned, and your leader in particular, has a very simple philosophy. You take short-term advantage, no matter how opportunistic, no matter how unprincipled. This is the morality of a government that is bankrupt. Now, what we have seen here is quite fundamentally a government that has lied. It has lied because it can see short-term advantage. It has lied because it feels that somehow or another it might be able to secure an advantage on some important legislation. And we all understand the implications here. This is about trying to buy a vote further down the track. We all know what the game plan is, and we know the lie that you have told. You have tried to present to us a proposition based on some action taken in 1990. You have not acknowledged that the deal done between you and Gareth Evans made it clear that that's the rules by which we play. You have chosen to rip that up. You have chosen. You have made it quite clear that there is a new morality. There is a new morality in this parliament. So what we've got to do is work by a new system of morality. So Senator Kemp, get used to it. You make sure you have got the numbers Senator for your Carr, proposition. Senator Carr, address your remarks through the chair, please. I take that. Uh, make very, very clear. Make sure that the numbers are there. I would advise all those on the other side, if you want to get your stuff through, make sure that you don't rely on trust, because you, have deserved, you deserve none. You have no honour. You have no credibility. Now, in this system, this system of government, you will rely upon the word of your opponents. You do rely on Senator, the, the Leader of the Government made it very clear last night at a procedure committee meeting. He congratulated the Labor Party on its capacity to honour its arrangements. And quite clearly, that's what we have done. We pride ourselves on honouring our arrangements. You quite clearly pride yourselves on your capacity to rat on any deal that suits you. The conventions of this parliament have been broken many times by you. You are making a habit of it, and if this is the game, let it be clear. There are consequences that flow from that sort of immorality. Quite clearly, we have an opportunity here, as been proposed by Senator Faulkner, to address this in a civilised way. You are not interested because you see there are short-term advantages to be taken. The consequences of that will be profound for you. When it comes to making sure that your program is addressed, perhaps then we will look at the question of short-term and long-term advantage. Senator Kemp, make sure you brief them well on the consequences of their action, because there's no doubt in my mind what comes around will you be paid out on you as well. Senator Harrody. Oh, sorry, Senator Kemp. Tim Carr gets up and speaks, and uh, the the uh, and and the point. The point is, uh, how well, Senator Fortner has been hopelessly exposed. He got up here. He got up here, Senator Fortner, and said, "What we have to do is, is to have a pair." No one could point to any precedent. No one could point to any precedent that a pair would be granted. Not one person on your side has stood up. Even Robert Ray, even Robert Ray, the de facto leader of the opposition, didn't get up and say that with a secret ballot a pair would, would be granted. But in the spirit of, uh, of uh, compromise and cooperation, uh, and after this uh, extreme speech by uh, Senator Faulkner, uh, Senator Hill got up, and I draw, I, uh, it's worthwhile recalling the Senate's attention to this, and said that uh, we, we will nominate two senators. We will nominate two senators so this procedure can, uh, can uh, proceed. Blind panic on behalf of the Labor Party. Blind, absolute panic on behalf of the, of the Labor Party. Uh, and so then, then the, the argument gets up. Then the argument gets up with Senator Ford. Well, we don't actually want that. We don't, we don't actually want that now. What we want to do is, is to wait until we can get 76 senators in the chamber. So Senator Faulkner uh, totally reversed his position. Totally reversed his uh, position. 
the argument was put, the argument was mounted. Uh, we pointed out that there were complications uh, with, with such an argument, uh, and clearly there are precedents which would be established if uh, pairs were granted in secret ballots. And there are a number of important contributions from senators which uh, showed the problems which would emerge. But uh, the point that uh, Senator Faulkner made uh, that, uh, about a pair was uh, effectively uh, accepted by Senator Hill. But the debate continues. And why does the debate continue? The debate continues for the simple reason that the Labor Party has not got the numbers. And that is the problem. The Labor Party has not got the numbers. They have reversed their position totally in the course of this uh, particular debate. And it is time now, it is time now, I think, that this whole sorry exercise was brought to an end, was, was brought to an end, and so that the, the ballot can proceed and we can uh, follow proper procedures. Well, Senator, For Senator Schott, at the start, you supported Senator, Senator Faulkner's Kim. first position, Senator and Kim. then on his second position Senator you got Kim. up and supported that too. And on his Senator third position Kim. you'll get up and support that. Address your remarks through the chair. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President. The, the point I'm making is that this debate, and the Hansard will show that, has flowed no, in an utterly absurd way. An utterly absurd way that the, uh, the position that Senator Faulkner made initially, seeking uh, a pair, uh, was responded to in a positive fashion by the government. And what we saw, what we saw uh, it was blind panic on behalf of the Labor Party because they have worked out, they have worked out, they have Order. worked out. What an extraordinary position. You get up, you, you mount an argument, I might say in an extreme and extravagant and silly manner, but in the, in the spirit of compromise, in the, in, the, in the spirit of trying to get things moving, the, the essence of that argument uh, is, is accepted. That essence is accepted, and uh, the, the, the same effect is if a pair was granted. And that was the point that Senator Hill made. But the reality is, uh, having accepted that, you still can't wear it. And you still can't wear it because the reality is that the numbers are not here. But I remind senators to uh, address each other by, in the correct manner in debate. Uh, Senator Curnow. President, I'd like us to resolve this matter quickly, and, but fairly. And there's been a lot of talk about pairs. I'd like to just remind the rest of us that um, nobody extends pairs to the Democrats, the Greens or the Independents unless we're seriously ill. And I believe Senator Foreman deserves that consideration. I know technically you're right. You are technically I know that Order. technically I know, Madam President, that the arguments that have made, been made about secret ballots and pairs are technically correct. They are technically correct. But the reality in this place is that party discipline does govern all votes for the major parties. Been here long enough to see that? And, and, the, point, and the point is you're asking us to believe that somebody on, your, on the coalition side is not going to vote for your nominee. And in fact, in fact that's most, we know that that is 100 per cent unlikely. But the order. Okay, okay. Order. And Senator order. Hill, Senator Hill has made an offer. I think it is a sensible offer, which gets around some of the technicalities. But in Senator, in Senator Sherry's defence, I also say, I need to be in the budget lockup too. We don't have the resources of government. I think it is totally appropriate that those who need to speak about the budget actually have access to the information in time to digest it. And so I don't want to have to give up my vote in this, on this occasion either. And I think the fact that Senator Sherry wasn't able to stay here reflects the fact that we don't have a May budget, we have an August budget. There's a coincidence of this ballot today and the date of the budget. And that's a problem, and we should be able to resolve that. I understand why Senator Faulkner says either we have the principle that the pairs can operate or we have the principle that every senator is entitled to cast a vote and we wait until they're all here. I think that's probably impossible to achieve today, except if we say, except if we say by way of compromise. Order. 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 Senator Faulkner. Senator Faulkner, I want to hear Senator Kerno. 
Thank Senator you, Senator Kerno. Unless we say by way of compromise, accept Senator Hill's offer of a pair to Senator Foreman, allow Senator Sherry and Senator Kerno to come out of the budget lockup at 7.15 and have the vote when we're all present at 7.20. The question before the Senate is that the Senator Evans. I'm not sure if there's any time left. Uh, I just wanted to make the point, uh, Madam President, that this matter has been about trust. It, uh, it now seems to me that the decision not to appoint Senator Baum to uh, his overseas posting till after this ballot begins to seem a little bit convenient and a little bit point suspicious. Of order. Point of order. Point of order. Madam President, understanding Order 9, the election for Deputy President. Uh, is to occur um, the, the first uh, sitting day after the 30th of June. I understand, therefore, that we would have received, and I'm asking for your clarification on this, that all senators have effectively received seven months' notice of this ballot. Uh, is, is, that, uh, is, that, is, that a, is that a correct standing? Or, is that correct? The motion before the chair. Senator Faulkner, I've been asked for a ruling. The motion before the chair is to suspend standing orders. So, the motion before the chair is a motion by Senator Faulkner to suspend that standing order to enable him to, to enable him, if it's passed, to move a motion to postpone the operation of that standing order until all senators are present. The, t the time for this. Suspension motion debate has expired. I put the question that the suspension of standing order motion moved by Senator Faulkner be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Faulkner be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Evans, teller for the ayes. Senator Benizza, teller for the noes. Senator Calvert, teller for the noes. Order there being 35 ayes and 37 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The sit would senators resume their places. The situation before the chair at the present time is that there being two nominations in accordance with the standing orders for the position of deputy president, a ballot will be held. Before proceeding to ballot in accordance with the standing orders, the bells will be rung for four minutes. Ring the bells.
Order. Time has expired for the ringing of the bells, and the Senate will now proceed to a ballot. Ballot papers will be distributed to all honourable senators. You are requested to write the name of the candidate for, which, for whom you are voting on that paper. The candidates are Senator West and Senator Colston, but I would ask all senators to be seated and remain in that place while the papers are distributed. Um, just before I ordered the bells to be rung, Senator Hill announced, but he may not have heard, that Senator Watson and Senator Peniza would not participate. I'd ask the clerks to distribute the ballot papers. I told you just to stay in your place. Have all honourable senators voted? The ballot papers will now be collected.
I invite Senator Calvert and Senator Evans to act as scrutineers.
Order. The result of the ballot is Senator Colston, 38 votes, Senator West, 34 votes. I declare Senator Colston elected Deputy President and Chairman of Committees in accordance with the standing orders. Senator Colston. Madam President, I seek leave to make a statement. Is leave granted? Senator Colston. Madam President, I have not yet had the opportunity of public, publicly congratulating you on your election to the high office of President of the Senate. I now extend my sincere congratulations to you and, in doing so, have no doubt that you will serve the Senate with great distinction. I thank those senators who gave me their support in the ballot for the position of Deputy President and Chairman of Committees. It is my intention to perform my duties at all times in such a way that will make it evident that the trust which has been extended to me has not been misplaced. I accepted the nomination of Senator Knowles for a number of reasons. One was that I believe that I can serve the Senate well as Deputy President and Chairman of Committees. Another was that I consider Queensland deserved better non-government representation in positions of significance in this parliament. That situation has now been partially redressed. No doubt observers, including some honourable senators, will try to analyse the party voting pattern in the secret ballot, which has just concluded, and question where my loyalties lie in this chamber. My loyalties will be directed not to any particular party or group of parties. Rather, my loyalty will be directed to the Senate and to you, Madam President. I trust that when our association as President and Deputy President eventually come to an end, my loyalty to the President will be judged to be of the same high standard as it was during the three years when I was Deputy to President Cybra. In carrying out my chamber duties, I shall aim not only to be fair, impartial and helpful, but also to be firm. I expect that most of us who have been in the Senate for some time would agree that the general tone in this chamber is not as high as it was in the past, and courtesy is often a forgotten concept. I will be doing what I can to see that unfortunate trend reversed. Such a reversal, however, cannot occur simply because this is the aim of the presiding officer and her deputy. It is up to all senators to remember that they are community leaders and behave accordingly in this chamber. In conclusion, Madam President, I again thank the Senate for the trust it has extended to me this afternoon. Senator Hill. Uh, Mr. Madam President, um, uh, I, I think I need leave too. I seek leave. Oh. Anyway, I, I, uh, I rise to congratulate Senator Colston on his election. Um, I recognise that he was uh, temporary chairman of committees for 12 years before he was elected deputy president and chairman of committees on the 21st of August 1990. On that occasion, defeating the candidate that I, I had nominated, um, and uh, it. it it's uh, interesting that the circle may have uh, turned, but nevertheless, we experienced uh, Senator Colston as, uh, as Deputy President before. We understand his, uh, his dedication towards maintaining the dignity of this chamber uh, and his determination to be fair in the chair. So we, uh, we congratulate him. And uh, uh, I might say to, uh, to Sue West, um, uh, um, bad luck on Senator Sue West. Well, I thought the precedent was set here. I, I, I understand, uh, Senator, your disappointment today. I might say that the candidate that I nominated, who was defeated by Senator uh, Colston in 1990, actually sub subsequently became Deputy President of the Senate. So, so uh, subsequently became Deputy President of the Senate. So, all of us, all of us, all of us who've been in this uh, business for some time experience both highs and lows. Uh, disappointment I can understand today, but disappointment doesn't last forever. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, uh, Madam President. 
On the matter of the election of the Deputy Presidency, I want to indicate to the Senate that the uh, Labor Party has very strong views uh, about the circumstances surrounding <coughs> Senator Colston's election. And I don't intend to demean the chamber or the occasion by expressing them now. Senator Lees. Thank order. Order. Just order. Order. Senator Lees. Thank you, Madam uh, President. Obviously, the circumstances surrounding both uh, Senator Colston's nomination and election were not what was expected by most in this chamber. However, the majority has voted, and we have seen the election of someone who showed, when he was in this position before, himself to be fair. And indeed, he, I believe, when previously in that position, was diligent and always made every effort to uh, be reasonable and indeed to work very hard for, for this chamber. I therefore congratulate him on his election and commiserate with the loser naturally. I look forward to working with Senator Colston, particularly in my position as chair of the Environment References Committee, and I wish him well in his position. Senator Margetts. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, on this occasion, I rise to uh, congratulate Senator Colston on his election. It, uh, there was a lot spoken today about uh, precedent, but perhaps it's important to note that it is possible or should be possible in this chamber for the position of speaker to be someone who's not of a major party and I think and, and president. And I do believe that that's important. And I would like to draw attention to the fact that it is important that we acknowledge that in the democratic process that this may was ever is going to happen at some time during this, uh, the life of the Senate, Australian Senate, and the fact that it's happened now, we should take the opportunity of uh, finding out what it might be like to have a person who's not of either major party and uh, experience the benefits that that might bring. And um, I'm very um, encouraged to see that it hasn't taken another 20 years to happen. Senator Boswell. Now, Madam President, uh, let me uh, congratulate uh, Senator Colston on his election to the, uh, deputy, the high office of Deputy President on behalf of the National Party. The circumstances are a little unusual, but that's uh, politics. There's winners and losers, and many a time I've sat over the other. Yes, I certainly, I certainly do know when, when the numbers are against you, there's nothing you can do about it. The indication that, uh, that uh, the vote was so wide uh, is testimony to the fact that there are other people that have supported you, other than the, uh, the coalition. And, uh, so I do congratulate you. I know that you will do an excellent job, as you did when the three years that you were deputy president. You acted with fairness, fairness even-handedness, and your knowledge of the standing orders was superb. And I'll know, I know that you'll use all those uh, uh, benefits uh, uh, for the Senate. And I once again congratulate you. Senator Harradine. Uh, Madam uh, President, I should like to join uh, with colleagues in congratulating <coughs> Senator Colston on his election as Deputy President of this uh, Senate. Uh, and in so doing, I'd like to commiserate with Senator West, as uh, I'd indicated, uh, well, I'd, I'd assume that Senator West would be the Deputy President at a particular stage. And of course, um, um, I uh, have had. Uh, um, I have nothing but respect uh, for uh, Senator West. Uh, the situ Order. 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 It order. I think that if you people on the uh, uh, who were given an, an in, uh, who were given an opportunity one month ago, when I myself took it on myself to try and 
uh, notify you that you had a problem on your hands and you ought to have a look at it and deal with the matter uh, with uh, some a degree of honour, uh, you may not have had this situation. Now, don't you say that to me. And I haven't, I haven't spoken. I did not speak to uh, these people uh, on the government, nor did I speak to the press. And I think you should think about those things when that sort of cheap shot is made. Um, Madam uh, Chair, I would like to say uh, that, uh, and I do apologise for for just saying what I what I did, I, and I apologise to you. So I, but um, could I just say, Madam Chair, that uh, I look forward to working with uh, uh, Senator Colston, both as uh, a deputy uh, president of this Senate and. Uh, as a fellow independent, we've actually doubled our numbers uh, overnight. Senator Kemp. Oh, I beg your pardon. Do you want to speak on the same matter? Statement when, uh, if I may. Is leave granted? I... Senator Coates. Thank you, uh, Madam President. And uh, may I congratulate you on your uh, appointment to that uh, position, unopposed? Um, I want to inform uh, the Senate of uh, my uh, resignation from the Senate. Uh, from the Senate, not from the Australian Labor Party. And I guess I'm a bit saddened by uh, the events of today, uh, having uh, got in the road of this uh, a little. I had foreshadowed in, uh, uh, in March that I was uh, proposing to resign uh, towards the end of the year, and uh, I've brought that forward by, uh, by some weeks for a a variety of reasons, partly to do with the uh, sitting pattern of the, uh, of the Tasmanian Parliament to ensure that there wasn't uh, uh, an unreasonable length of time before the appointment of my uh, uh, successor. Uh, so I guess I would like to seek a, a one-minute appointment with you a little later this evening, President, in order to uh, uh, deal with that uh, formality. Um, yes, well, so, uh, perhaps I should emphasise, given the events of today, that uh, I look forward to being a member of the Australian Labor Party for many years to come. Uh, my uh, first task, I guess, is to say uh, a few thank yous uh, to my family for their tolerance of this uh, political, political life over uh, so many years, to my staff, all of those who have been my staff, again, over uh, many years, a, a great variety of them. Uh, that my, my personal staff and, and the uh, committee staff of those committees that I have, uh, particularly of those that I have uh, been chair of uh, uh, in the Senate. Uh, I would like to thank all of those who work in this building who have been uh, helpful to me over the years and all of those in this town who have been helpful and the public service throughout uh, Australia and I guess particularly in Tasmania uh, who have uh, helped uh, uh, in so many ways. And I, it's sad that so many of them are uh, feeling a bit uh, unwanted these days. I uh, certainly express my appreciation to uh, the Australian Labor Party and in particular the, uh, the left of the party for giving me the opportunity to uh, serve here and I guess particularly those who uh, were uh, my uh, uh, supporters in, in Tasmania and of course the, the electors of Tasmania or those that uh, uh, have supported the uh, Australian Labor Party uh, over the years. Um, my departure from here will mean that there is then nobody left in this chamber who was a member of the parliament for the period of the Whitlam government, which uh, shows you the, how time uh, passes. And in the, even in the House of Representatives on our side, the only ones uh, who remain are uh, uh, Peter Morris and Ralph Willis. Uh, so that uh, uh, eras do, uh, do pass. Um, because uh, I did spend three years in the House of Representatives so before spending five years in the uh, office of uh, Senator Ken Reid in, in his electorate office when he was the leader of the opposition here, uh, and then uh, 15 years in the Senate. I remember saying in uh, 1972 when I discovered that there were uh, a number of people uh, 
that had been here for 20 and even 30 years at the time. If I am still here after 20 years, give me a reminder about this and make sure I don't uh, stay longer. Well, I guess I've been uh, a, a member of the parliament for 18 years, but it's uh, 24 or 25 years since I uh, uh, first uh, sought endorsement. So I think uh, some sort of uh, average of those times means that it is uh, uh, time to, uh, to depart. I will uh, obviously not be, uh, even if I'd stay, I would have obviously not been part of the next uh, Labor government uh, elected uh, at the uh, next election. And those, but those, those who, uh, but those, those who, uh, those who will be, uh, should be uh, uh, getting uh, getting in at this uh, at this point. And uh, uh, I uh, would also like to say that I guess I have uh, very mixed feelings about uh, departing, which I guess you would understand. Uh, some uh, regrets and uh, some relief, perhaps especially after today. Uh, the uh, uh, sorts of uh, uh, e events of today in the uh, in the Senate, I think, confirmed in my mind that I was uh, doing the uh, uh, the right thing. Um, I uh, I've never been entirely uh, comfortable making uh, speeches, as some of you may have noticed. And I'm not going to start uh, now. I guess you could say I'm not a particularly uh, <laughs> a good uh, uh, good politician, as far as not being uh, very good at. Um, uh, seeking publicity, but there are many things that I, I am uh, proud to have been uh, been part of, both uh, in the electorate and uh, and in the uh, the parliament and the and the caucus. I'm not going to uh, go through a long list. Don't get me uh, don't get me wrong, um, but it uh, it has been a privilege to have uh, served here on behalf of uh, the party. It's uh, a task that is uh, open to very few people to be part of uh, the national decision making process. Uh, I'm not saying I was always on the winning side in these matters, but, uh, uh, but to have been part of the process and uh, to be uh, involved is uh, a, a very great uh, honour. In fact, there have been actually fewer people than, uh, than I would have expected. I, at my count, there, were, there have only ever been something like 28 people who have been Labor senators from uh, Tasmania. So it's a, a very small, and I guess if you looked at your own states, it might be of uh, much the same sort of uh, uh, numbers that uh, it's uh, a very small uh, group from any one state uh, and any one party uh, who have uh, had this, uh, uh, this privilege. Uh, I have, of course, uh, many... Uh, uh